Once again, good afternoon. Everybody's awake. You have beer and coffee. <laughs> uh, I would like to welcome you to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to the 17th Annual Internet Governance Forum. I would also <coughs> like to welcome you to our high level session to discuss an important topic on digital trust and security. My name is Solomon Chassa. I'm a producer and host of a weekly science and TV show on Ethiopian broadcasting services. A founder of 1888 EP, a tech venture studio here in Addis, and a senior technology advisor on strategy. And I'll be your moderator for this panel. <coughs> Our digital security is under threat. Malicious actors are targeting the critical infrastructures of hospitals, airports, power grids with devastating human consequences. With severe attacks that have evolved in scope, sophistication, and targets, the internet is literally a virtual battle, battleground or battlefield. FBI's 2021 Internet Crime Report highlights in the US alone, it received a record number of 847,376 complaints from the American public in 2021, which was a 7% increase from 2020, with the potential losses exceeding $6.9 billion. 
In the past couple of years, COVID-19 contributed to new cybersecurity threats, the need for acceleration of digitalization, as well as investments in cybersecurity measures. Cyber attacks have grown globally as well, with sophistication, number, and impact in 2021. The global cost of cybercrime is staggering. It exceeds $6 trillion that year alone in 2021. This is according to a remark by the head of Leonardo, an Italian firm for aerospace, defense, and security during his speech at CyberTech Europe 2022 conference in Rome. This is just a highlight of what's happening in the cyberspace in terms of security and uh, trust. With attacks like phishing, SMS campaigns, malware, disinformation, misinformation, and ransomware, and crypto crime, cyber crimes have been on the rise. Meanwhile, technologies like AI and blockchain have proved capable of both damaging and protecting the environment. Several international efforts are underway to increase the global response to digital threats and develop norms, mechanisms, and confidence building measures to boost trust and security in cyberspace. On the climate side, the ITU has launched standards promoting green data centers, a coalition, of, a coalition to produce the global e-waste monitor. As digitalization is a key driver of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, considering all digital challenges is necessary. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said, and I quote, Looking to the future, two seismic shifts will shape the 21st century, the climate crisis and digital transformation, end of quote. Enabling that transformation includes mitigating digital risks. This session with this group of experts and distinguished panelists will explore gaps and barriers affecting digital trust and security in regional and global contexts, translate international normative frameworks into practical implementations, and share best practices for enhancing collaboration and coordination among stakeholders to build cyber resilience and align digital trust and security principles with the 2030 agenda. And to discuss these very critical aspects of the internet, we are so privileged to have a group of distinguished experts on this panel, both in person and online, hopefully, who will share with us their insights and perspectives. And I would like to invite our panelists who are online to turn on their camera at this point. Before starting our session, I'll briefly introduce our panelists. Everybody's here. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Tomas Hendrik Ilves, former president of Estonia and co chair of the Global F uh, Futures Council on Blockchain Technology. He's also a member of IGF Leadership Panel and he's joining us online. Her Excellency, Ms. Mufariat Kamil, Minister of Ethiopia, Ministry of Labor and Skills. Her Excellency, Ms. Emma Theoflos. Deputy Minister of Namibia's Ministry of Information and Communication Technology, Mr. Hiroshi Yoshida, Vice Minister of Policy Coordination for Japan's Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, Ms. Pela Cherkaseva, Deputy Minister for Digital Development, Communications and Mass Media of the Russian Federation, and she's joining us online. Mr. Wei Zhong Chen, Acting Executive Director of UN Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, Secretary General Elect of ITU, Mr. Taufik Jalasi, Assistant Director of, for UNESCO's Communication and Information, Mr. Netpick, US Ambassador at Large for Cyberspace and Digital Policy, Mr. Remy Marichu, Ambassador of France to Ethiopia. I hope I said it right. I'm not a Francophone. <laughs> Mr. Natalie Jersma, the Netherlands Ambassador at Large for Security Policy and Cyber. Dr. Martin Norma, Director of NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Mr. Chris Painter, President of Global Forum on Cybersecurity Expertise. Mr. Chris Sharak, Vice President of UN and International Organizations at Microsoft, is joining us online. And Mr. Tabo Mashigoni, Chairman of Africa ICT Alliance. Let's welcome our panelists with, with a round of applause, please. Just a few housekeeping items before we dive into our great discussion. I would like to kindly inform and remind our great panelists that each of you will be given a minute and a half to give your responses. I'll keep an eye on my timer and I might kindly pause you to move on to the next panelist. 
We also have our great colleague who's going to be the boss for the next two hours in front of you to remind you that your time is up with the flag. That's a great weapon for the next two hours. <laughs> but I have full confidence in each of you that we won't have to do all that because you will keep your responses to 90 seconds. After I read each question, I will call the panelists' name to give their responses. With that, we're ready to kick it off. So multi-stakeholder collaboration, which is here in display, gratefully, both in private and public, is critical to safeguard our digital space. So our first, first question is, what are the factors necessary for building digital trust and security between states and other key players? And what are the best ways to build an international trust framework that accommodates differing geopolitical worldview? Mr. Chen, over to you. Thank you, Solomon. I I'm glad that uh, I've been asked to be the first speaker how to respond uh, because I might doze off due to the jet lag uh, of my flight from New York. Uh, you know, the I see that there, we have a very challenging situation here and we have more complex issues in this regard. Uh, we see that the, there is a trust deficit between jurisdictions. Uh, not only for this, but also there is also uh, the trust deficit between governmental agencies and the service providers. Trust deficit between law enforcement agencies and human rights advocates. And also trust deficit between service providers and users. So I think that's as complex as that one when we talk about uh, building the trust between governments. So in this regard, we believe that the multi-stakeholders collaboration, uh, the public-private partnership, uh, the all government, all civil society, all society approach will be key to achieve that goal. The positive note is that the UN has this convening power and it has already started on a long journey to express, to explore uh, various ways to build that uh, common understanding and perhaps finally the consensus. Back to you, Solomon. Thank you so much. Ms. Ms. Jarsma? Thank you so much, uh, Solomon. And um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And um, thanks to uh, uh, the host government uh, of Ethiopia for uh, hosting us. It is really a pleasure to be here. Um, on building trust, let me start by saying that without trust in digital products, people won't use digital products. So that means that societies cannot reap the benefits of digitalization. And um, as we also heard this morning, then it would have a negative impact on achieving the sustainable development goals. So trust is crucial for achieving the SDGs. Digital trust is the result of many factors and relationships between uh, different stakeholders. But your question is specifically about states and building trust between states. Um, and I believe that starts with transparency. Transparency on for example, the interpretation of international law on national legislation, on its implementation, on intentions, on procedures that are in place in order to respect interests of other states. Um, and it also has to do with holding states accountable. And there, I believe that all stakeholders have a role to play. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Arsman. I think we have Mr. Fick online or here. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon, and thank you all uh, very much. Uh, my name is Nate Fick. I, uh, this is my first IGF. Uh, I'm, I'm the new U.S. Ambassador for Cyberspace and Digital Policy. 
I think you're right to focus on the word trust. Trust is the currency of the digital domain and it's more important than ever. Uh, we're connecting something like a billion devices per quarter to the internet. That trend is accelerating. Uh, organizations of all kinds are migrating to the cloud and the COVID pandemic accelerated trends around uh, decentralization of people uh, and their associated technologies in every enterprise. So uh, this is more important than ever. I'll highlight two uh, concrete uh, factors in building digital trust and security. The first is adopting an inclusive and multi-stakeholder approach. I think the multi-stakeholder term is especially important in this forum. Um, my own background is as a, an internet uh, entrepreneur and a technology investor. Uh, so I have a personal visceral appreciation for the importance of uh, the private sector and civil society organizations. Uh, and I think that durable consensus requires their engagement at every step. Uh, the second factor, I'll point to the framework of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, which all, uh, I repeat, all UN member states have repeatedly affirmed as a foundation uh, for building trust among states on cybersecurity. I would challenge any of us to come up with anything uh, on which all UN member states would agree and sign today. Thank you so much, Mr. Pick. Over to you, Mr. Painter. Uh, thank you. And uh, like uh, the other speakers, I endorse everything they said. Uh, I, I was in the government and now I'm a multi-stakeholder, so I've seen both sides of this. And in 30 years of doing cybersecurity and fighting cybercrime, which I've done in my career, I've seen the threats grow in uh, sophistication and number, and particularly in impact. So trust between countries is vitally important, but it's also important to note, as others have said, that countries are not the only players here. They're important players, but civil society, the private sector have a role. And so that multi-stakeholder approach is important. And I'm gonna focus on an aspect that my organization, the GFC does, which is cyber capacity building, because the way I look at capacity building is it is vital, it's foundational to all of the, to combating all the bad things we see on the internet, all the threats we've been talking about this morning and, and now, but also achieving all the good things. Uh, if we're gonna achieve the sustainable development goals, or we're gonna achieve all the positive things the internet has to offer, we need to engage in capacity building because states, and fo focusing on states for a second, if they can't meaningfully engage in these processes, if they don't have the capabilities to secure and have resilience to their own systems, they won't be able to get anywhere. So capacity building really is a key underlying effort that my organization helps promote uh, with members, both countries, civil society, and, and uh, private sector from around the world. And that collaboration between those parties to do capacity building, to undergird all these things, including uh, take, taking forward the norms goals is critically important. So I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so much, Mr. Nagishu. Merci. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, Mesdames, Messieurs les ministres, les ambassadeurs, chers Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, Ministers, Ambassadors, Delegates. Defending a vision, a, a joint vision in a, a cyberspace is something that's important for all of us and a priority for my country, France. Our trust and security goes through the respect of the international law. Cooperation in the area of capacity building, which has been mentioned, is also essential. Uh, I need to specify that um, it's not about having uh, uh, all this, but uh, ensuring that uh, internet ha is uh, guaranteed and ensure that we are secure with it. We need to ensure trust. And this is the uh, gist of the conversation and uh, um, much stakeholder approach is important. The states, international organizations, civil society, and all platforms are collectively responsible. This is a method of inclusive work that we want to follow in a collective banner. And, uh, we have three initiatives in France, which we you know very well. That's the, the working with New Zealand on uh, clusters, and then the Paris appeal on cyber security. All these initiatives have a, a common point to mobilize all actors and ensure trust and guaranteeing security in cyberspace. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I do believe that we have Ms. Jacqueseva online. So over to you. Добрый день, коллеги. Да, я здесь. Довольно острый вопрос, должна признать. Alex, yes, this is a very uh, acute topic, and indeed, uh, the global trust is the basis of any wonderful cooperation 
among countries, but it's only when uh, the states share their principles. It's just like any sport, like soccer. Any country in the world uh, follow the same soccer rules, including fair play. And this is a sports version for global uh, digital trust. Unfortunately, currently during nowadays, we do not have uh, any common rules. We do not have the foundation for the further development of global trust and security. Our key actors, such as states and uh, global digital platforms, have their own understanding of um, what it is to behave correctly in the digital environment. And whatever works for um, one actor sometimes does not work for the others. And we see that sometimes the private sector and corporations follow their own rules. Uh, it is obvious that the world is and first of all, it is important for the countries that can ensure the trust and security in the internet and safety as well. And Antonio Guterres, General Secretary, um, Secretary General for the UN, uh, spoke about that in his address last year. There is still tension in international cooperation and situations around certain countries around the world does not allow to begin the process of uh, creating um, the um, framework for uh, reaching a consensus. The only way to build trust is to follow the principles of equality and respect sovereignty of the others. We support cooperation with um, international uh, organizations. and collaborative ways to make our digital space safer, safer most, more secure and trustworthy. Do want to hear my I would like to draw your attention to the crux of cyber norms with our next question. How can stakeholders be more meaningfully involved in the development of cyber norms? What norms are necessary and how can the UN's norms on responsible state behavior in cyberspace be translated into practical steps? We're gonna start with Mr. Jalasi. Thank you very much. As you may know, the mandate of UNESCO is to promote the free flow of information. How we do that? One way is capacity building through our programs. Second, by setting up normative instruments for the 193 member states. Briefly, let me mention two examples. Last year's UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI, which has a component dealing with trust among others, but also respect of human dignity, respect of human rights, enforcing gender equality, but also the respect of the rule of law. Now we are heading towards another normative instrument through our next February conference, which is called Internet for Trust, regulating digital platforms to ensure information is the public good, not information becoming public hazard or public harm. I mentioned this morning in my opening remarks, some of the key features of this conference intended to combat misinformation, disinformation, hate speech online, uh, uh, conspiracy theories and the like. So briefly put, this is what I would like to say at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jalasi. Over to Mr. Sharik, who's online. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be able to join you. So on, on the meaningful involvement of stakeholders in the development of cybersecurity norms, uh, it has to be recognized that there are not many official avenues for participation. But significant progress has been made over the past few years. And I would point in particular to the process that has been established by the Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime as a good practice that could be replicated in other discussions. 
in addition, there have been processes established outside the, the UN, such as the Paris call, which the French ambassador referred to a moment ago, that I would encourage stakeholders to become engaged in. Beyond that, I, I just want to underline the importance of consulting with the multi-stakeholder community, no matter what the official processes say. In terms of practical steps, the multi-stakeholder community can be particularly involved in the implementation of norms. So one fantastic example here is, is uh, an exercise that has been the work of the Oxford process, where over 100 lawyers took the fairly general statement of international law applies and worked towards an agreement on what that means in specific contexts, such as in the protection of elections. Similarly, Microsoft worked with the Czech Republic and the Cyber Peace Institute to develop a series of, of recommendations on how to implement the norm on protecting critical infrastructure in the healthcare context. So these types of activities are critical if we are to ensure that all states are able to implement agreed upon norms successfully. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Sharik. Appreciate it. Next response from Your Excellency, Mr. Fayed. Thank you very much, Solomon. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, as uh, uh, everybody's uh, trying to follow this uh, platform from uh, uh, across the world. This is a great opportunity for me to be here, and I would like to say you welcome to Ethiopia. I'm Mufarihat, and I'm Minister of uh, Labor and the Skill of uh, Ethiopia. I think the subject matter we're trying to deal with uh, is about uh, trust, though it's about digital trust. It's about the relationship between people. So when we talk about uh, uh, trust and how we're going to engage stakeholders as to the expected level, uh, to my understanding, uh, there must be um, a change in attitude about the issue, the matter. And we are trying to deal with uh, the technological aspect. But I think there has to be a shift in a people-centered approach as it is about relationships. It's about peace collaboration and interdependence. If that is the case, we need to empower people starting from school through our education system and bringing all the different stakeholders together. Though we have uh, so many norms, unless and otherwise we can have that multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, we can't achieve at the end of the day what we designed. So we need to have that multi-stakeholder engagement through a new way of thinking, taking the subject matter from, uh, you know, technological uh, or instead of uh, from protecti protective measure to proactive measure, uh, rather through transformational measure, and we can en engage uh, and empower uh, the different stakeholders uh, to come together so as to address the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Next is over to Your Excellency, Ms. Theophilos. Thank you so much, uh, Solomon. A very good afternoon to everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Well, I think the first would be to discuss what are norms. Um, and norms are generally beliefs um, within a community. And at a global level, this requires every stakeholder in this global villages of ours to have some type of belief in order to have some cyberspace norms. And then the next question I'd like to ponder is how are norms formed? Um, if we are to form these norms, how are we to form them? Where do we derive them from? And who is able to adapt them? And then further than that, who decides on uh, these norms being written down and being applied? And I think then coming to the 
to, to the answer to some of those questions would be that we need to have some type of consensus. There has to be some type of agreement between governments, uh, the international organizations, private sector stakeholders on what our bottom line beliefs are. And if it comes down to the person, we're talking about mutual respect, human dignity that Mr. Uh, uh, Tofik spoke about here earlier. And then I think I would end by saying, then in its application, there needs to be some consistent and uh, proper favorable application of international law. Um, because once that is done, when all of us have accepted those norms as universal to all of us, then there can be consistency of implementing and those norms succeeding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Excellency. Next is over to Ambassador Maggie Shu. Thank you. Merci. C'est bon. Oui. Donc, sur ce thème, la, la France encourage une approche euh, multi. This theme, we encourage the multi-stakeholder approach on issues to do with uh, digital cyberspace. This seems to do when we look at the process of the UN in the experts governments group and the working group. Uh, now, this, this approach to adoption of the resolution for a working program of the UN on the 3rd of November, and it's the sign for investment of states to face this challenge. We follow an aim of ensuring that the responsible use of ITC in the concrete terms, this is a permanent mechanism, which is inclusive and which is geared towards action within the UN. It has three aspects, supporting states in the implementation of a framework through responsible behavior in the use of ITC, encouraging activities of capacity building. Secondly, to promote dialogue and cooperation between the stakeholders involved, that's the private sector, uh, the academia, civil society, to contribute to better implementation of this framework. Thirdly, to give states a permanent forum to look at efforts for implementing this and to discuss new challenges to international security in the area of digital technology and implement the framework through consensus. This program will be coordinated with the work done by the existing elements. This is not a process of parallel negotiation. We are, we can't wait for working with all states in the next session uh, in an unlimited composition so that we can follow the implementation of this. I thank you. Mr. Chen, would you like to add UN perspective on this matter? Thank you. Thank you very much. In anti uh, trust and also an anti uh, terrorist attack activities, it's easier to say this than done. We have been working on this for more than 30 years. We are still discussing about this. At the time I was a young man, now I'm still uh, talking about this, but I'm old, so handsome, of course. My hair is gray right now. I hope this discussion can lead to a international treaty. Since we don't have a definition at this situation, in this situation, we still have a long time to go. This is a uh, bumpy ride. But we do have some basic principles, such as 19 uh, international anti terrorism documents and more than. 10 Security Council's documents and uh, guidelines, all of these can be our principles. Uh, CTEC will continue to work on these. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Marcogoni. So what's uh, Africa ICT Alliance's stance and perspective on this matter? Over to you. I think at the core of it uh, lies 
a co-creation. And co-creation platform in an environment of a mutual respect where all participants have got the same stature and they've got uh, equality in, in, in being able to uh, 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 contribute. We currently have a spectacle called the World Cup and one has to ask themselves, how did it happen that even the remotest of the countries are able to partake in a, an environment where they are equally uh, looked at and they can fair play in this environment. So we need to, to learn from such and, and create the same platform uh, with regards to, to this uh, 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 creation of the norms and also participation in that. And one asks uh, with regards to the critical basic norms that are there that must be uh, adopted. And the, the key is to actually put the human at the center. The ones that it deals with uh, uh, human rights uh, is critical that those norms are the ones that are put at the, at the fourth. Once you, you deal with those, you are able to then cascade into either a, a bigger community and, and into further other as aspects. And implementation starts with the pledges, and then you have to go into complex and also answering the question of what is in it for me and, and, and making sure that uh, everyone does uh, implement it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we do have Mr. Thomas online. So over to you, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'll try to be as brief. Um, my concern is that cy uh, cyber norms uh, are put uh, before the, um, <clears throat> or <clears throat> as having priority over common values. And I think without the common values, it's not really possible to develop cyber norms. Uh, there are there are countries and there are societies that have freedom of expression, and there are others and there are countries and societies that fr have free and fair elections. Uh, and there are multi-stakeholder groups such as uh, one I participate in, the the uh, Transatlantic Commission on Electoral Integrity, which makes sure that democratic norms are followed. There is no point in actually doing any of that if you do not have freedom of expression in society. Uh, there's no point in doing it if you don't have free and fair elections. And so um, really uh, the fundamental rights and freedoms predate discussions on norms because if you can't agree on the fundamentals, you can't really develop any meaningful norms. And so too with cybersecurity, um, the, no cybersecurity umbrella organization will work if you do not have uh, do not have a common set of uh, interests in maintaining a common set of values. I mean, that's just the way it is. There's no way you're going to share information with countries that do not follow fundamental norms um, in an area that actually precedes the the discussion of of uh, norms in cyberspace, because ultimately the norms of cyberspace should be, in my point of view, and I think much of the, uh, <clears throat> the world, the norms of cyberspace are also the norms of, of, a, um, of a free democratic society. Thank you. Mr. Tomas, thank you so much. Uh, we do apologize. We do have a, a flag here, but the online people won't be able to see it. So if I interrupt you, uh, I do apologize in advance. I appreciate all the respondents for your great perspective. And with that, uh, we're going to move on to the next question. It's about climate crisis. So with that climate crisis at the top of the global agenda, as we know it, what are the approaches, uh, what approaches should we be adopting to ensure technologies are part of the climate security solution and not the problem? And how can we introduce greater accountability on those issues? Perhaps in the areas of more greener data centers, blockchain infrastructure and manufacturing, better recycling. It can be a responsible mining, which is very sensitive for some, some nations and so on. So uh, to give that reflection, uh, I'm going to give it over to Mr. Yoshida first. Mr. Yoshida. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to join you here. And um, yes, digital technology can be can be pro problem, and uh, it can be a threat to the climate 
change issues. And uh, so, for example, data traffic in, in our country has doubled since the outbreak of COVID-19. And then there is an estimation that says uh, in 2030, um, energy consumption in, in digital field uh, would be would rate to 36 times com compared to now. And um, in 2050, there is another estimation it would rate to 4,000 times. It's it just for only it just only for uh, digital digital related field. So that but it can double the whole nation energy consumption by 2030. And uh, we need to develop new technology. And um, one of the solution to this can be beyond 5G technology. All photonic networks technology uh, can reduce energy consumption um, to only to one percent uh, to the con convent um, so existing technology. So we are we are now developing a such new technology so that uh, digital technology can be a crisis but on the other hand it can be a solution one more thing at the same time how to use digital technology is also important and spreading air and sensors to every corner of society to enable monitoring um, can uh, build a resilient society to climate change and natural disaster thank you thank you, thank you mr Ishida. from our online speaker Ms. Chakaseva, over to you. Спасибо большое. На мой взгляд, ключевой вопрос – это то, как мы можем использовать цифровые технологии для поддержки. Key question is how we can use digital technologies to support developing countries, to support their economies in the context of neutrality. Given the recent COP27. I think it is important to highlight that we need common efforts to improve access to technologies and technologies exchanges between different countries and to improve coordination of global value chains. chains. And also we need to uh, get rid of the barriers of trade barriers. For example, agriculture is an important player uh, when it comes to uh, greenhouse gases and we cannot solve the climate problem without including agriculture in the solution in order to improve the situation in agriculture we need new technologies and this will be our new objective we will use digital technologies for agriculture to improve its sustainability in russia we have a number of projects in this respect for example we monitor greenhouse gases using spaceships which enables us to use digital innovations to um, mitigate the greenhouse gases and their effect on uh, on the nature in this complicated international context which exists today we need international organizations to create stability for states i would like to remind you of the itu and its leading role when it comes to digital technologies and communication. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Next question, the same question goes to you. I think this is maybe a more important topic for Africa because we can't just be the victim of climate, climate crisis while we're not the most beneficiary from the digital technology. So what's your perspective on this, Mr. Mashagoni? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the mic's gone like me. Okay. Can you hear me? I can't hear you well. Thank you. We cannot, we cannot hear you well. Yeah. Can you fix the mic, please? Uh, it should be witchcraft. Um, yeah, I think uh, in, when one speaks of this topic of uh, environment and climate, that topic is a sensitive topic that actually needs to start with trust and the behavior that actually uh, follows on on the on the claim is very important. You cannot say one thing on one one side and do another thing. So it's very important. So that is, I think, uh, the the point of departure. And then from that, 
it's important that we have what we call environmental consciousness when we speak about technology starting from cradle to grave. As you innovate right up until we dispose of, of the technology, we have to get to be environmental conscious because it starts on the concept itself of when we are actually innovating that we must get our thinking right so that we are, are align with uh, the environmental uh, goals that we, we've got. I will stop it here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, Ms. Mufayat. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, climate security directly implies about uh, food security as well. Uh, whether technological interventions can help you in solving this problem or not uh, is at the major uh, center of the question. So what matters is the way how we use technologies. Technology, yes, technology can be a solution regarding uh, preventing this problem. Uh, for instance, if we consider uh, the uh, green uh, environment, there are technological interventions. Uh, we can consider the case in Ethiopia uh, regarding green legacy. It is a technology-backed uh, local uh, uh, or indigenous uh, knowledge and skill taken by my Prime Minister, His Excellency, Dr. Abi Ahmed. Uh, the first uh, interest or target of the uh, initiative was reaching out 80, 18 billion uh, trees to, to be planted. But um, we've reached 25 billion, not million, billion trees within the last four years. This is a local initiative backed by local or indigenous skill and knowledge of the people. So everybody, everybody was um, a part of it. So when we talk about technology, uh, we shouldn't only uh, think about the high end of technology, you know, local and indigenous uh, knowledge and solution has to be also part of it. So my answer to this question is yes, and we need to look into what we have. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Over to you, Mr. Jalassi. Thank you very much. I believe that efforts to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 are essential to combat climate change and minimize the resulting harm. Digital technologies in particular, advanced analytics and AI are crucial here since we know that AI can allow reductions of five to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is very important. Number two, I think there are three key dimensions that we need to emphasize. The number one, policymakers should be aware of these technological advances and what they can do to enable combat climate change. Not only to be aware, but to integrate these technologies in their policies, in their strategies. Two, capacity building is essential. We may be aware of the technological capabilities, but we don't have the human resources skilled enough, competent enough to make proper use of technology. And finally, Open data and open science are crucial here as instruments to develop and monitor uh, climate change policies. Let me conclude by saying UNESCO last year adopted the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation signed by 193 member states, which allow, among others, open science, open data to all countries worldwide. And this is very important for the capacity building I referred to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Bogdan Martin, I know ITU has a lot of stake in this and in doing different initiatives, so over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think there are many parallels that can be drawn between the climate crisis and cybersecurity. Um, both have been debated for decades. Both seem to be polarized in terms of discussion, sometimes politicized. And of course, the threats loom larger than ever before. I think on both fronts, we need what the UNSG would call a breakthrough. And if we don't have that, we're gonna have a breakdown, uh, as, as he often says. And the good news, as previous speakers have, have mentioned, is that of course, digital technologies do have a critical role to play when it comes to climate issues, monitoring, mitigation, adaptation, 
Of course, the bad news is that we're also emitters of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think we need to be as green as possible. We need to be advancing green standards. We need to be tracking uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, we need to be, as, as, uh, as Topic just, just mentioned, collaborating on the policy and regulatory front. I think we need to up our game in terms of e-waste. You mentioned the monitor. We only have 78 countries that are actually have uh, e-waste policies and legislation. Uh, I think we also need to be advancing early warning systems. We welcomed the UNSG's announcement of um, $3.1 billion uh, to ensure that we have early warning systems in the next five years. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, everyone. Now we're going to move on to the, our next question. Um, so how can countries build meaningful and sustainable cooperation among stakeholders within their own borders and beyond? What are some of the examples of successful sustainable cooperation on security, meaning South-South, North-South, and Triangular? To kick it off, I'll start with Mr. Yoshida. Thank you. Um, I think uh, there is no end uh, to uh, in, in tackling uh, cyber security issues. And uh, cyber security risks are increasing and uh, we need more human resources. Uh, two important things. First is a public-private partnership. For example, we built up an information sharing system between public sectors and private sectors in our country. And the um, second point is uh, continuous human resource development. So we, we have some activities such as uh, ASEAN Japan Cybersecurity Capacity Building Center built in, established in Bangkok uh, in 2018. And uh, we also have a joint project with uh, World Bank, and which is called the Digital Development Partnership Initiative. Um, capacity building support for developing countries in Asia and Africa. This in, in, initiative has been expanded to a multi-donor cyber security fund at the World Bank, and the support is now underway from um, US, UK, Netherlands, Estonia, and other, other countries. So no immediate solutions or a magic remedy to cybersecurity issues. We should keep going on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ms. Jarsma, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, building cooperation between stakeholders within a country, I think it partly depends on uh, the culture. Um, yeah. I'm from a country, the Netherlands, that is below sea level. And we have always learned how to fight the water in a multi-stakeholder way. So um, our culture is very much that our decision-making is based on consensus uh, decision-making based on multi-stakeholder engagement. And, uh, but as a more general lesson learned for other countries, I think if a country wants to have productive multi-stakeholder engagement within the country, a good start is by um, the stakeholder that has the most power inviting others to have a say as well and be part of the decision-making process and share some of your power. So that is also what, uh, how our attitude as the Netherlands is in the international uh, sphere. Um, we try to, um, we are a highly digitalized country, but it also comes with responsibilities. So that means that we try to listen to others and we try to help others to leapfrog into the digital age. Um, that is why we established, together with other countries, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise uh, that Chris heads, but we're also supporting the program of action. We're doing um, uh, capacity building on international law. Um, so we're trying to um, share a bit of those digital experiences. Thank you so much, Mr. Peek. I think we're all learning firsthand just how short 90 seconds is. Uh, so I'll give two examples right away. Uh, the first is domestic in the United States. We have something called the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, which is a partnership among federal, state, local government, 
and the private sector. And the key to its success is two-way information sharing, not information sharing in one direction where you give me your information, I classify it, and you get nothing back, but actual two-way information sharing so that it's mutually beneficial. Internationally, an example, uh, in my view, that's successful is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, in its work on confidence building measures in cyberspace. And the key to the success of that initiative, in my view, is that these CBMs are negotiated when tensions are not high. That is, they're negotiated iteratively over a long period of time uh, so that there's a durable consensus to use them when tensions are high. Thank you so much. Next is Mr. Ms. Bogdan Martin, over to you. Ms. Bogdan Martin, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to pick up perhaps on, on, on Nate's points, we, we do, in order to achieve this meaningful and sustainable cooperation, it needs to be based on dialogue. It needs to be based on stakeholder engagement. Um, and as Chris, you were saying before, it's, it's not just between nations, it's also civil society as well as, uh, as citizens. I think we do need new models, and I liked your point before, you were talking about co-creation. I think that's, that's key. We need to take holistic, whole-of-government approaches. Of course, we need international institutions to do their part. Uh, ITU as lead facilitator for Action Line C5, building confidence and security in the use of ICTs. We do our part. Of course, we also work with partners like Chris's institution, the GFCE, in capacity development, like with FIRST, when we do our, uh, our, our development of, of CERTs. And of course, we have our global cybersecurity index that looks at exchanging best practices and identifying gaps when it comes to legal measures, technical measures, organizational measures, capacity development, and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Tomas? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll try to be briefer this time. Uh, I, I'll give you three examples of, of, of well-functioning, uh, sustainable cooperation. I'm not sure how much you like them, but the best one I've seen yet is the NATO Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity, which includes many of the members of North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, also uh, all neutral countries in Europe, but for the North-South dimension also has in it as members, Australia and Japan. So uh, that's, that's, those, that's an organization based on uh, trust, based on uh, respect for common values, and it has been extremely effective and been functioning uh, ever since uh, after the massive cyber attacks on my country and 2007 and uh, since then has performed now for 14 years. Uh, a second example of the sustainable cooperation are digital prescriptions pioneered in my country and which first began to became interoperable with Finland and then later on with uh, Portugal, uh, Croatia and the um, um, the Faroe Islands. And finally, I would say that the we have also set up a, a, a cyber national guard, strictly voluntary, and which is uh, probably the ultimate form of civil society of sysadmins and other uh, digital people in civil society working together to uh, safeguard our cybersecurity in Estonia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Over to you, Mr. Painter. Uh, thanks. I I'd say two things. One, um, only 11 years ago, I was the first or one of the first cyber diplomats in the world. And that's not that long if you think about it. And so elevating this issue to a diplomatic policy issue and cooperation between those authorities, two of whom are on the panel, Natalie and Nate, is important, but it's a different kind of diplomacy. It's engaging with other stakeholders. It's not just states. And, and consulting with other stakeholders, as happens in both those countries and many others, is important. The second, not surprisingly for me, is capacity building and the importance of capacity building uh, to all of this, but uh, to sustain development, sustain cooperation. But it has to be inclusive. And as I said, the GFC is a model for this. We're a multi-stakeholder institution, uh, 170 members and partners, including about 60 countries, uh, civil society, 
uh, the private sector. And as Doreen noted, uh, we have partners of the ITU, of uh, the Organization of American States, the African Union, UN ECHO, uh, ASEAN, and many others. So that's important. Two examples. Uh, one, very quickly, is uh, working groups we have around key thematic issues. We also have a global uh, uh, portal called the Sybil Portal, which is open to everyone. And then finally, and most, I think, uh, appropriate for this audience, we're doing a African experts network. For the last couple of years, we've been setting this up, African cyber experts working with the AU, working with the community to build African capabilities and to, to really drive a more demand-driven approach, not just what we wanna give or the, the Global North wants to give the Global South, but the Global South saying, this is what we need and having a partnership. Thank you so much. Dr. Norma, before you respond, I must say, I must say that you're gonna get three minutes because you were supposed to be one of the respondents in the first question. So if you have a reflection on digital trust along with this question, over to you. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you very much. And uh, I really think that uh, it was good that my uh, Russian colleague spoke so long during the first question, um, because trust and cooperation is all the same. So it's even better to reply these questions together. So as uh, our former president, Thomas Henry Kilves, already said about NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, it's all about trust and cooperation. We have 38 different nations uh, in our center, and our purpose is to support our nations to be able to face cyber threats together as a coalition. Because cyberspace, as you all know, does not have borders, and cooperation is extremely critical there. So uh, how do we create this cooperation? And I think there is no uh, miracle here. There are two very simple principles. The first is to know your neighbor. And the second one is to build trust with your neighbor. But you can't trust a neighbor who do you don't know. So the first thing is to work on uh, doctrine development, standardization, best practicing, lesson, uh, practices, lessons learned together with this community. And this is done by experts, uh, software developers, uh, legal uh, researchers, uh, boots on the ground. Then they learn to trust each other through this practical cooperation and personal trust. I think this is the most valuable, uh, valuable thing. Also here at uh, IGF, where all these people, all you across the world are coming together to uh, also to build trust between each other. So, um, and I would uh, conclude with an example. Uh, the example is Ukraine and uh, Estonia, my home nation, and Ukraine has uh, have had extremely good cooperation on uh, building digital societies. A lot of uh, Ukrainian excellent digital uh, uh, nation is built up based on experiences from Estonian uh, e-governance. And now Ukraine has uh, moved on so fast that Estonia is really considering to build our next generation of e-governance, partially at least, based on Ukrainian ex, uh, uh, experience. And this is the finest example how this mutual cooperation uh, for mutual benefit of economic benefit uh, can help uh, both nations. And last but not least, uh, at NATO CCDCOE, unfortunately, mostly we have to deal not with the traditional cybercrime or uh, um, misinformation that we talk here today. Actually, I think nobody has mentioned yet state-sponsored cybercrime. And we know there are a couple of nations, at least in the world, who make this their business to sponsor as many cyber criminals as possible. And uh, it can be political gain or it can be financial, direct financial gain. And now when our friends in Ukraine are under attack from their bigger neighbor who doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, like the fact that Ukrainians are loving freedom and want to have their borders intact, so, uh, of course, we are all doing, giving our best to bring peace back to Ukraine and cyberspace as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to move, move on to the next question. So the objective of uh, a safer digital transformation is to improve people's lives rather than to create digital divide or to put countries at danger. So the question is, how are vulnerabilities in digital trust and security connected to human rights and economic situations? in Africa and elsewhere? And what are the challenges to overcoming these vulnerabilities? Mr. Mashagon. Thank you. I think loss of IP, loss of IP, identity, assets, sovereignty, are as a consequence of actually having vulnerabilities uh, in, in the cyberspace. And over and above that, 
what we ought to see and deal with is the basics. So the basics are on the basics of respect. Self-respect translate into respect for the rights of others. And it is with that that you start uh, having to self-reflect when one has to actually do harm to the other. But this is a lifelong thing that starts with the culture. And I've seen one word which is called uh, atarimai, I think it's a Japanese uh, word for good karma. And it is through doing good that the good comes back to you. But we, we have to instill this in our processes. And we have to deal with the issue of social engineering. So social engineering is something that is a number one vulnerability point in which uh, education, continuous awareness, in essence, uh, to do a uh, capacity building on, on this subject matter is critical uh, for us to deal with the, the issues at hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, Ms. Motoria. Thank you. Um, security is uh, a human right, so digital security is no different. So creating a human-centered, creating a human-centered trusted in cyberspace for peaceful engagement and coexistence is fundamental. This entails reinforcement of positive peace and harmonious coexistence in the cyberspace. Peaceful cybersecurity practices, policies, and strategies to place people at the center with a systematic approach, addressing technological, economic, social, legal aspects without neglecting the national interests in order to optimize the freedom, economic, and social benefits expe expected from uh, digital openness are case. So, in this regard, there are competing and conflicting interests. What matters is how we're going to balance those competing and conflicting interests matters more. Thank you so much. Ms. Bogdan-Martin, over to you. Yes, thank you. In 2021, Interpol found that GDP in Africa was reduced by 10% due to cybercrime. So that economic impact is not disputable. It's clear. And cybercrime risks, of course, are increasing. Uh, new technology is presenting additional risks and trust is taking a hit. And Natalie, as you, you mentioned this morning, without trust, society is not going to benefit from digital transformation. Universal trusted meaningful connectivity to all and protecting the means to communicate is absolutely fundamental to the ITU. Uh, we believe in a rights-based approach to digital and of course, building trustworthy networks and services needs to include security, protection of fundamental rights, including privacy, freedom of expression yeah. and others. And of course, we demonstrate this through the work that we do in our national cybersecurity strategy support, in the work that we do with UNESCO, in our partnerships with OHCHR. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Sherrick. Yeah, thanks, Solomon. So when it, when it comes to cybersecurity challenges, we, we hear very, very similar concerns wherever uh, we look around the world. And the number one concern is people. So simply, we need greater investments in the general understanding of the threat landscape, and we need a greater investment in the skilled specialists. Uh, that's people that understand the importance of human rights in security as well. So technology companies have driven significant investments in the resilience of their products and their services over the last few years. Microsoft last year committed over $20 billion over five years to advance our security solutions and to protect customers. But while we increasingly rely on innovative AI solutions as part of our defense against malicious attacks, this still requires that input from those skilled cybersecurity professionals. 
And as it stands, there is said to be an expected shortfall of 3.5 million jobs by 2025 in the cybersecurity industry globally. So to address those challenges, it comes back, of course, to multi-stakeholderism. We need to, to work together across civil society, private sectors and governments. Microsoft, for its part, is actively helping to cultivate a skilled cybersecurity workforce. Earlier this year, we announced the expansion of our cybersecurity skills campaign to 23 countries. Um, our Microsoft Cloud Society program provides skills paths tailored for careers in security. And finally, Chris Paint has already talked about the important work of the GFCE. We are actively supporting the work of the GFCE in the Africa region, uh, specifically Thank with you. the establishment of a regional capacity board. Well, first, I'd say that uh, obviously cybersecurity and vulnerabilities are important to achieving economic growth and, and the digital transformation that everyone talks about at this conference and other conferences. If we don't have good cybersecurity, if it's not built in, it undermines all of that. In Africa in particular, as they're building this, these new structures, if they don't have good cybersecurity, it'll undermine confidence in others and, and it has a clear economic effect. And similarly, in terms of the uh, human rights agenda, uh, we often see some nation states, also criminal and other groups, targeting civil society, uh, targeting uh, uh, you know, various actors within society. Uh, that's been a problem. I remember meeting at IGF eight years ago now with a bunch of civil society groups who were worried that the promotion of cybersecurity strategies would impact civil society because they weren't being consulted. And some countries were using them as proxies to try to uh, actually suppress civil society. So, so as we think about this, Human rights and economics are part of cybersecurity. They're all part of each other. And as I look at the challenges and possibly the, the, uh, the solutions to this, we can't continue to treat cybersecurity as this niche issue, as a siloed issue. It has to be mainstreamed into our security policy, our economic policy, and our human rights policy, and our diplomatic policy. And we need to break down what we used to call the silos of excellence between these different stakeholder groups. So the technical community, the policy community, the security, the economic, and the human rights community, the development, traditional development community, and the cybersecurity community, uh, and all of those, and Africa and everywhere for us to make progress. Thank you so much. Mr. Gelasi. Thank you very much. Clearly, vulnerabilities in digital trust and security are sometimes due to data misuse and misgovernance that we see in place. This cl clearly creates concerns about human rights. You just mentioned this a minute ago. Uh, privacy, autonomy, discrimination against some groups, especially women. Uh, other vulnerabilities, which are quite wide widespread in Africa, include uh, you know, uh, lack of access to data, to uh, technology, hardware, but also access to digitally savvy human resources. And here I want to say that UNESCO conducted recently a major uh, survey in Africa, we involved 32 countries to assess their needs in artificial intelligence. What came out from this result? Three key findings. Number one, building human and institutional capacities in AI and digital technologies, including addressing the gender equality issue. Less than 20% of professionals in AI and technology are women, less than 20%. So the gender equality is a burning issue. The, uh, building the human capacities, UNESCO is proud and humbled by having trained over 9 million youth in Africa in the field of coding and programming in partnership with SAP. And also the third priority is advising governments on putting in place the right digital strategies uh, th that are needed and building the partnerships for successful use and deployment of AI and digital technology-based applications and systems. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, Ms. Theophilos, over to you. Thank you so much. Well, the vulnerabilities in Africa actually come down to a life and death situation. If you're talking about critical infrastructure, a hospital, 
uh, being a, having a cyber attack, water systems, electricity, that many instances, there aren't no alternatives in smaller places. So that could actually critically impact the ability of somebody surviving. And then of course, disruption of peace and harmony, because many times the disruption could actually instigate certain groups where violence is concerned. And then the lack of respect that Tabo was talking about for, for contributions by unique groups um, and marginalized groups and how that uh, many times we see cultural appropriation with out fair compensation for unique uh, intellectual property. But then of course, um, I would say would be loss of income and livelihood. Um, cyber attacks have the potential to take food out of children and out of the hands of many a times mothers in many of these areas. So I think um, if the ring could recall at the WTDC held in Africa, the first um, as a country, as Namibia, we pledged at the Apartheid to Connect conference that building up a CERT and having a cyber bill is important because cybersecurity within relation to critical infrastructure literally means life and death for many of our communities on the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elfrost. Mr. Thick, over to you. Thank you. So digital technologies are intrinsically connected to human rights and economic prosperity. And think about it in any of our lives. In just the last two years, it transformed, digital tech has transformed how my parents consumed healthcare, how my children access their education, how my wife and I earned our livings, how all of us engaged with our communities. So access is essential. And it's worth remembering that there are two different kinds of lack of access. Uh, you have the almost 3 billion people around the world who are still unconnected. Uh, and Doreen has been doing terrific work and will continue uh, at the ITU to do terrific work uh, as Secretary General to close that divide. But there's also a second category, which is more than 150 examples this year alone of governments intentionally disconnecting their people. And that uh, is something that we have to condemn in all of its forms. So on a global level and from a security perspective, as countries further develop their ICT infrastructure, we urge them to prioritize security. We all should promote an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure digital ecosystem. And that includes resilient supply chains, and it includes the use of trusted suppliers. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. We now move on to our final but very important question. So what practices can we adopt to address the global spread of misinformation and disinformation? And how can we ensure informational synergy to reach better consensus? on global crisis in climate and health. Uh, to start it off, Dr. Norma, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I would give two uh, examples. So first is kind of small scale. Uh, in Estonia, uh, our former president, uh, Thomas Hendrik Ilves, already mentioned Cyber Defense League. These are volunteer, mainly, um, mainly software developers. In their free time, they support their national cybersecurity. And uh, one of the components is also kind of finding and commenting on uh, misinformation campaigns in media. And so uh, they, they get a lot of uh, airtime to speak about uh, these uh, misinformation campaigns, either about vaccines or then about uh, war in Ukraine or other examples. So this is one, but it's, it can't be scaled up too much. Or based on volunteers, we can't solve any, everything. But the second thing I think most important is that it's just about education, education and education, and not only educating software developers and engineers, but educating everyone, uh, all our citizens to understand and recognize the truth from uh, lies in information domain. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Thomas. Yes, thank you. Um... Well, uh, my uh, my colleague and countryman, Dr. Norma, already talked about um, this issue. Uh, we have uh, we have a considerable civil society element in debunking or first finding and then debunking disinformation that is in my country, uh, because frankly, the government really can't spend doesn't have the uh, wherewithal to devote that much time to all of the disinformation that comes our way. Specifically, I'll bring an example, not from my country, but rather how, how disinformation affects health. 
Last year, RT, the Russian TV station in Germany, was actively propagating anti-vaccination propaganda. Uh, at the same time, uh, in domestic media, they were telling people they would be fired if they don't get vaccinated. Clearly, there is a uh, almost a uh, cyber biological warfare element to this kind of disinformation. And so it's it's more than simply having getting the wrong beliefs. It is an active element that affects our health. And we need to be aware of these tendencies around the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Jarsma. Yeah, thank you. Um, on disinformation, I um, think that the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression, Irene Khan, has done very important work. And basically, um, she explains that the best line of defense against disinformation is by creating the conditions for human rights, pluralism, and to tolerance to flourish. So, as Nate was just referring to actions to disconnect people from the internet, rather than taking that decision uh, as governments in case of disinformation, please consider funding um, pluralism, ways to increase that pluralism. And uh, of course, even with a very pluralistic media landscape, this inf information can still create chaos. And then sometimes interventions are legitimate. Uh, but proportionality is key here. So debunking false information, um, educating four times, five times, uh, and of course, a certain level of moderation by uh, social media platforms is the way to go. Thank you so much, Mr. Yoshida. Thank you. And um, we're addressing a climate change healthcare uh, other issues. Uh, getting correct information is a crucial one. And this, this information misleads citizens and delays resolving global issues. Um, it did, the important thing is that the government does, should not impose a top-down judgment of truth or falsehood. Society should deal with it through multi-stakeholder discussion. On the other hand, each stakeholder has its own responsibility. For example, the government needs to provide objective information and experts provide scientific evidence. And when doing so, freedom of thought and speech should not be impeded. How to deal with disinformation and at the same time foster common understanding in society while protecting freedom of speech is an issue of priority and requires global multi-stakeholder efforts. And also media literacy is also crucial too when fighting against disinformation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Chakaseva, over to you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, misinformation and disinformation, fake information is a weapon in the current international environment. And please believe you me, we are very familiar with this in, our, in my country. And we currently face uh, a lot of attacks that have been planned in uh, cyberspace. We are talking about DDoS attacks and um, other types. And the dominating role uh, is uh, fake information. Uh, just for you to understand, the Russian information resources have experienced 80% more information attacks and about 9 million fakes, fake news have been distributed uh, this year in our cyberspace. It is very important to understand how to fight this phenomenon. And it is very important that the information sphere does not stay in va vacuum. It should be filled. Currently, the information space uh, is uh, very fragmented. 
and the many groups and even countries uh, engage in it actively and mostly common users suffer from that. Right now, we believe that we need to uh, form rules of how to act responsibly and how to regulate this activity on the world scale. Right now, digital giants uh, are overusing their um, their possibilities, and we think that we should have a common uh, set of rules of how to use the global digital platforms, it, probably under the umbrella of the UN, and we believe that uh, it is one of the issue, of the topics within the uh, digital global compact. Terrorism and violent actors, they are using COVID-19 to increase social dissent. So we need to fight this information. So our counterterrorism agency has included our uh, such work in our dialogue with member countries. We have also worked with international organizations to provide a report for the Counterterrorism Commission uh, for reference. We found that member states have a need for capacity building at the policy institutional implementation levels. So on the basis of respecting international human rights laws, we still see some gaps. So the Counterterrorism Committee adopted a deadly declaration requiring member states to continue working in counterterrorism. So on this agenda, our work cannot uh, stop. We have to continue our work. Thank you. Thank you. Excellency, Ms. Dessler. Thank you, Solomon. I think I have only two answers. And the first one would be digital literacy. I think at the end of the day, um, we need to arm citizens with the right skills and abilities um, to meet out and debunk fake news and misinformation, but also to fact check. And I speak this from experience because as Deputy Minister of Communication, at the height of the pandemic, we, we try to communicate the right information and to try to debunk um, fake news, misinformation, disinformation at the time and height of the pandemic, um, it was very difficult. Um, and we could only depend on actually teaching citizens on how to do it themselves. People have agency, so we need to arm them with the right tools in order to do that. And because people have agency, um, they will share this stuff, especially if they don't have the skills. This is why we need to put increased pressure and responsibility on social media, uh, uh, social media uh, platform uh, companies and organizations to actually moderate better. Um, because with, with that proper moderation, we're able to circumvent when we have not adequately given people the necessary tools and literal skills in order to, to debunk uh, misinformation and fake news. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Mr. Narishu, over to you. Merci, merci Salomon. Uh, beaucoup des intervenants précédents ont parlé de l'éducation. Uh, many thanks, many thanks, Solomon. Many speakers talked about this uh, disinformation, but the main vectors for fighting against disinformation uh, that's uh, ensuring quality and independence. I want to talk about two initiatives that we participate in. The first one being partnerships for information and democracy. Uh, which is under Medicine Sans Frontier. In 2009, 45 states have, are in these partnerships to promote the access of freedom of expression and access to free information, which is reliable. This Summit for Information and Democracy was organized uh, in September last year in New York and in the margins of the UN Assembly and an observer and an international observatory on information and democracy was launched and, uh, uh, on the model of, on climate responsible for assessing the evolution of informational global space. The second initiative is the National Fund for Public Media, which was launched at the 
for Paris Forum in 2021 with an initiative where, where France contributes financially uh, up to 20,000 euros. The Secretary General of the UN uh, said that uh, uh, the press and international media were threatened by the risk of extinction. extinction. So this partnership, which is a multilateral and independent, is part of the response to this challenge and uh, it's aimed at increasing uh, funding available uh, and supporting independent media in developing countries. The other aspect, other regulation uh, in the EU, we're working on better regulation and uh, in the uh, digital service, uh, which we impose the platform to report to the author regulatory authorities, the authorities which are faced by democracies by sharing measures that they want to put in place to fight these uh, um, problems. It's illegal and uh, uh, it's illegal to, to be outside line and legal to be online. Thank you. Thanks, Solomon. Uh, well, it won't surprise you that this is another area where, where I think that a multi-stakeholder uh, approach is the right approach. And, and Microsoft is dedicated to supporting a healthy information ecosystem where trusted news and information can thrive. So, so we, we recently developed uh, an approach to countering disinformation, which is based on our four Ds. So the four Ds for protecting information integrity uh, that, we, that we use in Microsoft are, are, first of all, detect. We hunt, track, and investigate perpetrators of disinformation. After detecting, we then seek to disrupt operations. One way is to use the power of transparency to alert the public about new cyber influence operations. Another is to address the financial supply to known disinformation websites by preventing ads from being placed on such sites. The third D is deter. We want to strengthen and extend in international norms to protect against disinformation and create a standard of behavior for nation state information campaigns. And the fourth and final D is defend. And this gets to the positive steps that can be taken to bolster the information ecosystem. Part of this is about information literacy, educating the public about how to be a sophisticated information consumer, uh, and the other part, as has already been said, is about preserving and, in fact, reinvigorating traditional journalism in order to safeguard the provision of trusted news. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. On this final question, I was personally hoping that you would touch upon deep fake and deep platforming. Uh, and those are something very important, but uh, thank you so much for your wonderful perspective and insights. As we wrap up our panel, uh, I would love to give each panelist to uh, reflect any final remark they might have. This time is going to be more challenging. It's going to be 30 seconds. So with that, I'll start with Mr. Tomas. Mr. Tomas, 30 seconds. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. I would start by repeating what I said here throughout as a common thread is that common values and rights uh, precede uh, any specific forms in cyberspace. We must uh, respect fundamental rights and freedoms as we do in all other realms, also in the cyber realm, freedom of speech, free and fair elections and so forth. And that I think uh, should be our guide. Thank you so much. Your Excellency Muparyat. Thank you very much. And I would like to emphasize on uh, the, about the new thinking or rethinking of uh, the matter itself. Because the central point of uh, uh, the issue, uh, how we're trying to do is to see it from the perspective of uh, you know technology and we can't solve or address this problem um, by focusing on a singular an approach and solution so the rethinking is seeing this important issue from the perspective of uh, uh, people so that uh, we can see how we can coexist in a peaceful manner not in uh, the way how we handled, rather uh, through a tr transformative approach, uh, instead of focusing on uh, protective measure, why don't we focus on proactive measures? That's the question I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Mr. Flos. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, I think in closing, I would like to say that for there to be digital trust and security, we need to view one another as equals and valuable partners in making the world a safer place for all of us, global north, global south, whatever geopolitical position in the world, all of us need to be equal partners and not where one um, is disadvantaged in a partnership. So equal, equitable partnerships that are transparent and where all of us can come out as winners and not some as those who basically just come out as, as the bait um, at a time when all of us value our citizens and value our security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Yoshida. Thank you. Um, we propose the concept of a data free flow with trust in Osaka, G20 Osaka Summit in 2019. And um, where trust exists, uh, we can accelerate the data flow. So, uh, however, the important thing is that uh, trust should not be made only by one stakeholder, not only by government, not only by business. It should be, trust should be fostered through multi stakeholder approach. And uh, we, we want to discuss further on this issue also. Japan is hosting an um, um, IGF meeting uh, next year. And uh, we, we are look, looking forward to discussions on various issues um, discussed or to be discussed here in Aziz, including uh, bridging digital divide, Imagine, um, uh, resilient infrastructure, this of information, privacy and security, and um, data free flow trust, emerging technologies, and so on. Uh, we, we are look, looking forward to see, seeing you uh, in Japan next year. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Trakaseva, over to you. Uh, naturally, today, the digital uh, security topic is uh, one of the priorities for everyone and uh, Russia has been uh, promoting this topic um, in the UN and we think for a number of years and we think it should be resolved at the international level. I would like to remind you of an incident with Akronik um, and it's probably uh, a good case to mention here in Africa. Akronik was getting a uh, status of an international organization uh, and it was denied at some point and it, it has to be reviewed further including the multi-stakeholder model uh, with the UN. Also I would like to mention that uh, Russia has undergone a uh, global uh, digital experiment that uh, we have uh, with students. We would like to share our experience with other countries and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity and invite everyone to participate uh, in the second summit of Russia and Africa that will take place in St. Petersburg in the summer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, James. Uh, ICT is a double-edged sword. It has to be used effectively, but also in a smart manner. And I hope everyone will tweet or retweet this in your account. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bogdan Martin. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess my takeaway would be that the urgency is there. We can't wait. Um, we need to take large scale joint action. We've heard some great solutions today. We need to build on that. And I think we, we all have a role to play, be it youth, be it women, governments, including parliamentarians, the private sector, civil society. And I would also just pick up on, on Emma's point about media literacy and digital literacy, um, and that we shouldn't underestimate what each of us can do as individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jalassi. Thank you. I believe, first of all, that all stakeholders are essential for protecting human rights online and also the rule of law. Second, UNESCO remains committed to supporting member states face the challenges uh, of the digital age through capacity building in AI and digital transformation. We recently, within the UN Broad Commission, 
for sustainable development published a competency framework on AI and digital transformation for civil servants, which we think is useful for governments. Third and lastly, we need norms based on human rights, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder participation to ensure that technology is developed, used, and governed in a human-centered way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Fick, over to you. One of the most dangerous misconceptions about technology is that it's all about the technology. And in my experience, tech problems are really about people, process, and technology in that order. So let's invest first and foremost in people. Let's do it through capacity building. Let's do it by elevating tech as a mainstream diplomatic issue. And let's do it by engaging in multi-stakeholder fora like the IGF. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Marichou, over to you. Merci. Uh, la, la confiance entre les parties prenantes est Many thanks. Uh, trust between stakeholders is, is important to ensure uh, security online. And the three pillars of this trust are one, respect of the international law, uh, as it was said previously, um, which is forbidden offline, must be forbidden online. The second one is inclusiveness. Uh, internet is something that has been established in multi uh, stakeholder way. We must protect it. Then transparency is the third one, like the use of certain algorithms so that the users can use them as openly as, as possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we need to implement what we have agreed to. Um, so, especially at the state level, we have all agreed that international law, including human, human rights law, applies online. Um, as well as offline, obviously. So we need to implement that. Of course, capacity building is needed for that. And uh, it's really up to the broader multi-stakeholder community to hold uh, states accountable. Um, then since this is an internet governance forum, I would like to make a distinction between technical internet governance and the internet governance um, of content if you will and the technical layer please um, don't fix anything that is not broken it is done by a multi-stakeholder community it has never failed us uh, it has been functioning since its very existence but then everything that is on the content layer yeah we certainly need to have a discussion there um and there, we also need to be realistic because there are differences around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Norma. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, I believe we all in this audience, we share the values of uh, uh, what we want. We want peace and prosperity for our nations. And as we have clearly established, cyberspace and the internet is a way to go to uh, enable this, this uh, prosperity. And also we establish that the cooperation and trust is the key. So let's do some action. Let's actually, for example, let's develop our e-governance systems together across borders. Let's do our whatever apps and uh, technology solutions. Let's do them this way that many nations can use them. And uh, this way we can really build trust between individuals, uh, software developers, experts, boots on the ground. And then we will all have peace in cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Painter. Thank you. I think this is a new exercise we should the Microsoft, uh, the microphone exercise. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> um, two things. One, I think we made a lot of progress, which is great, but we have a long way to go. And I'd say that as I look at this over the time I've spent doing this a long time, cybersecurity becomes a priority when something bad happens for about 15 minutes and then it goes away. We can't afford that anymore. We have to make this a long-term sustainable priority. As I said, it underlies the sustainable development goals, economic prosperity, human rights. So breaking down those barriers is one way to do it. A multi-stakeholder approach is another, which is critically important, and capacity building is the third. And I'd say that uh, if you want to have more information about my organization, the GFC, you go to the website, thegfc.org. So thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Sharrick. 
Thanks, uh, Solomon. Great, great discussion. Uh, main takeaway from me is that this, this must be a collective endeavor, uh, whether it's about protecting individuals and organizations from cybercrime or defending against cyber attacks on critical infrastructure or tackling disinformation. This has to be a collective endeavor. So we, there needs to be a coordinated and comprehensive strategy to strengthen defenses. This is a task that will need the private sector, the public sector, and the civil society to come together in partnership. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to create accessible, fair, and inclusive platforms and processes that views all stakeholder voices as equal. This will be a very good foundation for both respect and trust and it's a, it will be a platform for and a foundation for bigger things to be built going forward. Just to quote uh, uh, Vincent, let's roll up our sleeve and do the work. <laughs> thank you so much. Once again, thank you so very much to all our distinguished panelists for a very candid conversation, for shedding light on this very important topic, and for providing your very insightful perspective on how to make the internet a better, trustworthy, and a safer space. I hope we all took notes of these nuggets of thoughts and wisdom to better shape a safer digital future collectively. Please give our panelists a very warm round of applause. As we know it, the internet's success may be attributed in large part to its unique paradigm, which includes shared global ownership, open standards, and its accessible technology and policy development procedures and processes. Since its inception, the internet has achieved a remarkable success because of its transparent, collaborative, and open nature. Having said that, the internet is also going through continuous changes and challenges alongside an ever-evolving and a growingly complex world. Digital trust and security are at the core of a healthy global internet ecosystem, and they are crucial for a successful digital transformation because innovation, leadership, and socioeconomic well-being are highly reliant on trust that must be earned every day from all of you. I, I'm very optimistic that everyone, all of you policymakers and experts, decision makers, and all of us as one big family of humanity will come together to protect and safeguard our precious digital space, which we cannot fathom living without. I would like to thank the UN, IGF's organizing committee and staff, and the Ethiopian government for hosting such a beautiful forum. I hope you will get to enjoy the warm hospitality, beautiful tradition and culture, delicious food, coffee, and music of this, this beautiful country of ours that we call Ethiopia, the land of origins. Thank you everyone for attending our session. With that, I conclude our panel. Thank you. <laughs>